forward to this event and building community and giving people a space to share um, and interact. I mean, clearly a lot of us have been in isolation for so long and with everything going on, I think that today will be a really important opportunity for people to kind of sh to share, you know, and ground it in community and connection. Yeah, and I hope this is the first of many of our connections. Me too, mm -hmm. me too. Hey Chaz, thanks for joining us. Chaz is our community coordinator. She just started this week. Oh, welcome. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Awesome. So miss to dive into what I want people to do without maybe sharing about why I think it's important and why it's mattered for me. And um, I have found in my life that finding a path to connection with people through civic engagement and feeling like my voice could actually make a difference has really had a profound impact on me. When I was a kid, I remember so often feeling like I would look around and see injustices and it would just make me mad. And I didn't understand how people could be cruel to each other or not care about their neighbors. And um, I grew up in Georgia and I think I grew up in an area where maybe my opinion and my voice was um, not the one I heard most commonly and actually often felt like there was something wrong with me <laughs> and <laughs> knew that I didn't belong, at least um, didn't belong in the, in the stream of thought that I was around for sure. And um, found myself in Pennsylvania about close to 15 years ago now and um, accidentally kind of volunteered myself into a staff role in the Obama campaign. And during that time, I really started to see for the first time ever in my life that I could make a difference. Like, I think before that I felt like I'm just one person. Like I can, you know, I can volunteer, I can make a difference, but I didn't feel like I had a place in systemic change. And for the first time ever, I really started to embrace the idea that one voice, one vote, one person, that, that I as an individual really could change things. And about 15 years later, here I am. Um, and I have the privilege of being with all of you tonight and getting to hear your stories and the things that have brought you here. And um, I'm just so proud to be part of the work that Philly Counts is doing. The census is such a unique opportunity and all the civic engagement that we do, there's all these rules about who counts and who gets to participate. And the census is the one thing in our country, the one civic activity where every single person counts. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter. It's just wherever you live, you count there. And I think that that's a really powerful message and it's really great to be a part of. Um, so I'm, again, very, very happy to be with all of you tonight and appreciate this, this space. And um, do wanna share about Philly Counts Fridays because we are working really, really hard to raise awareness about the census and to get people thinking about it because it is a little wonky and we do have a few things going on in the world right now. So um, we have some t-shirts and some hats. You see people with hats on and t-shirts and buttons. And on Fridays, we are asking people to wear their Philly Count swag and um, talk to people about the census and the fact that it is Philly Counts Fridays. So um, in, in true fashion that there's a lot going on in the world right now, I'm realizing it's Friday. <laughs> I didn't even really think about what day it was and I don't have my swag on. So um, at some point I'll sneak over and I'll get something so I can, I can be ready to go too. But um, I do encourage all of you to please remind people that you know that the census is absolutely critical. It's, it's our path to representation, which is our voice in whether we agree with the things we see in the world or we don't. And it is also about all the funding that we get to support people in times like these. And with the, with the recovery around COVID on the horizon, the census is gonna be more important now than it's ever been. So thank you. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I really always get jazzed up talking to Stephanie because she has such a passion for the work that she does in the community. Um, I recently moved from Philadelphia, as in three years ago, moved from um, Charlotte, North Carolina, back to Philadelphia. And her Southern warmth 
<laughs> always makes me feel kind of like, you know, part of home is here in Philly. So I really appreciate your passion, Stephanie. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for the partnership. Um, so with, I will move on to the next portion of our program, but just to give you guys a little glimpse into what we have in store for you today. Uh, we, as in Philly Counts 2020 Census and the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and Hospital of the, uh, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania uh, have all come together as well as some of our longtime friends of We The People Stage to build a really dynamic program for you. So we'll be hearing, we've always done stories sharing and story slams on theme. This is no different. The only difference is um, twofold. This event has several different nuances. So we're gonna be hearing about why Philly counts. Um, we are going to be hearing from frontline heroes um, who help us get through this very, very, very stressful time and challenging time on a daily basis. We will be also hearing from some artists and poets and entrepreneurs on the topics of everyday grit and faith. Uh, we also have a very talented speaker who happens to be a veteran and a minister on the line, as well as our venue partner, Mike Myers from Current. So you'll be hearing from, again, the University of Pennsylvania. Then we'll go to Ava and Jameer from Philly Counts. We'll hear from Mr. Mike Myers from Current Brew and Brew. Then we'll talk, touch on Everyday Grit with Jamina, Marshall, and Lito. Yes. We'll hear from Jimmy, Jimmy White the Fourth, and finally Petros Papalis and Shauna on the topics of Everyday Grit and Faith. So just so you have a little bit of an idea of what the three hours is going to be encompassing. We do recognize that this is a virtual event. We appreciate you for staying for however long you can. Um, but we definitely encourage you to stay and listen to some of the really, really amazing stories that we're going to be hearing tonight. So without further uh, delay, I'm going to introduce Miss Terry Lipman and the folks from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, including Marcus Henderson, Claire Bennett. We have also with us Jennifer Gill and Frankie. I'm gonna definitely butcher your last name, Frankie P. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, your group. Hey, uh, Terry, Marcus, Claire. <laughs> Frankie and Jennifer, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, we're we're good. We're doing um, great. We're we're so happy to be here. And when you were talking about community, it really made me think. I mean, Penn School of Nursing is committed to community and has a lot of community engagements, but we have new communities all the time. And we the people stage is a new community. Philly Counts 2020 is a new community. And what happens when we're engaged in new communities is it makes us better nurses. And being engaged with the census and really thinking about the census has made us better nurses. And we're also here to share our stories. This is, as you said, an incredibly challenging, difficult time. And we're all together. So I'm here with the students from Penn Nursing and my colleagues from the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania, and we are just um, grateful that we're part of this. Um, you know, I was thinking today about a story and I was thinking about, um, I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse practitioner, I work with children with diabetes, and yesterday I got a call from a child who was home alone. Her 10 years old, her mother was at work, she works in a nursing home, um, her grandmother, who usually watches her, can't come to the home because the mother's afraid she's going to infect the grandmother. So this is a 10-year-old child with diabetes who's home alone, taking insulin, checking her blood sugar. She's home with a 12-year-old brother, but essentially she's home alone. And she FaceTimes with her mother and her grandmother every time she has to take a shot. 
And she called me because she couldn't find her mom and she was crying and she was anxious. And while I was talking to her, her mother called her back. And it just, it made me think about how much anxiety there is at this time and how difficult and isolating it can be. And we all have some similar stories. Some of our stories are personal, some are professional, um, but we're here to share and we're here to be part of the community. And, and Marcus, you know, I know you've had a really challenging time in the past couple of months and you've been really generous about sharing what you've been through and how that's kind of impacted you as a nurse. Yeah, thank you, um, Terry. Um, like Terry said, I'm a nurse. I, uh, I practice as a child and adolescent uh, psychiatric and behavioral health nurse here in the city. Uh, born and raised Philadelphia native, so I am so fortunate to have the opportunity to provide care back to the community that I was raised in. Um, and, um, you know, I've had a very personal experience. I actually tested positive for COVID uh, very early on. Um, when everything started, uh, you know, happening. I was in California in the beginning of March, and then that's when the ship docked, I mean, the cruise docked in San Francisco, and that's really when we, you know, the nursing home in Washington started, and that was like, oh, this, this, is, this is coming. This is going to hit us by storm. And I remember shortly after that, uh, you know, I began developing symptoms and was t called my doctor, got tested at a testing site, and lo and behold, I tested positive. And I remember my first feelings were just of guilt. The guilt that I was not on the front lines. I wasn't with my colleagues during the beginning of this and experiencing that with them to support them, to have them support me. And I remember just feeling this immense guilt. And I think on top of that, fortunately, I was able to take care of myself at home um, but I also had the advantage of being a nurse, you know, knowing to take 10 deep breaths an hour to prevent complications with, you know, my lungs and breathing and things like that. And it made me think about the people that don't have that knowledge, who don't know when their blood oxygen levels might be low by, you know, different using a stethoscope to listen to their lungs. And it made me just starting to think about, and then you see on the news that all these people are getting sick, going to the hospital and, you know, the, the, the sense of community is gone because everything shut down. You know, everything goes to, goes to virtual. And as someone who has experienced anxiety and depression before, I felt that coming on because I didn't know what was going to happen. One day I could go to sleep and be fine. And the next day I could wake up and not breathe. So I remember just being, you know, starting to get the, that intense anxiety. And then, um, you know, it was my family, it was my friends, it was my nursing family that really uh, was my support system. And the way that I got over my guilt, if you will, was participating in advocacy efforts just to make sure that nurses and other healthcare uh, providers and essential workers and the public just had what they needed, the information they needed um, to get through uh, this together. And then, you know, for my patients, I think, um, you know, they don't get visits. They don't see their family. Um, you know, I work in an inpatient environment where some outpatient caseworkers and therapists and things come in and that's, that's, that's no longer. So we as the nurses are playing a lot of different roles, not just the nurse or, you know, being that all those other support systems that people uh, normally would have. So it's, it's been interesting when it's a field that re relies heavily on in-person interaction. Right. Um, so now we're seeing more patients having acute mental health episodes because they can't go to the clinic. They can't see their therapist. Their family-based home visit worker can't come to the house. Um, parents have to go to work and kids are home alone like Terry talked about. So you begin starting not only to take on your own burden, but then the burden of the people you're caring for because you're trying to be that in right. place of what they're missing. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, there is so, as you said, such a complex se series of challenges um, that we face as a community and definitely you as healthcare providers. So uh, I would want, I'm wondering if any of the other nurses that are on. I actually want to touch base on that because yeah. when I heard you talking, Marcus, you felt the first word that you said was guilt. 
And I remember that feeling so vividly because I also got very sick. So I'm an ER nurse and I remember walking my first shift before, you know, as we started the conversations of how are we going to see patients and preparing and we weren't even doing testing at that time. So this was my first shift walking into work where we were going to do that. And I remember picking up hours that week and feeling like, you know, this is the time I'm being called and it's my duty to, to work and to provide for my community. And I, that very first shift when I walked in, um, we were screening ourselves and I was found to have a fever and I didn't even know at the time. Mm. So uh, I didn't even care for a COVID patient or a success, a suspected COVID patient. And I was told that I needed to go home. And at that very moment, I just felt so guilty that I wasn't able to be with my teammates, coworkers, colleagues, and, you know, that excitement and duty transition to fear and anxiety. And I personally did not feel comfortable talking to my family or talking to, you know, I knew that you were going through the same thing, but, you know, I think that we could have probably done a better job with like supporting each other in that way. And, other people who are going through the same thing. So I felt a lot of this common themes that you explained. That's super interesting. I'm so sorry to hear that you both contracted it. I'm so happy that you appear to have recovered. Um, Doing well. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Um, you know, not everyone uh, can say that. So I'm really happy that that's your story. Um, but yeah, Frankie, uh, do you, what's been your experience as you know, a frontline worker. So it's actually very interesting sitting here listening to Jill and Marcus's stories because I feel like I was going to say the exact same thing. I work at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania. I'm an RN there. And uh, my unit was the first unit to become a COVID unit at the hospital. Um, so since March 9th, we've been caring for patients with COVID-19, um, which has been one of the most stressful experiences I've gone through in my life, but I also tested positive for COVID-19. And I guess about like three weeks in, two weeks in, and my first gut instinct was guilt. And it wasn't guilt for the community because I knew I was being safe and keeping social distance and quarantining beforehand, but guilt that I wasn't going to be able to be there for the patients. I wasn't going to be able to be there for my coworkers. Um, we talked a lot about community too. And I think such a big part of nursing is the community you create with your coworkers. Nurses go through something I don't think anyone else goes through with your coworkers. And it creates this special bond between everyone. Um, and my instant reaction was guilt that I was not going to be able to be there to help like fight alongside them. Um, so very similar experiences for sure. That's really, you know, one of the things that stands out, clearly the three of you have contracted COVID, you've recovered. It's just, I can only imagine a very scary thing. And uh, Jill, I think you had uh, mentioned or touched on that there might be a little bit of stigma around contracting it. So there's also that like sense of isolation and Claire, I would love to hear, you know, what's been your experience with this whole situation that we are finding ourselves in with the pandemic? Yeah. Um, I also work at the hospital university of Pennsylvania. I'm Claire. Um, I'm an ICU nurse and I actually did not knock on wood, contract COVID. Um, fingers crossed. I, can't even imagine, you know, feeling like you've worked so hard and then, you know, feeling the guilt of not being able to support your peers, which is not the case, by the way, that's not how we feel. Um, but my, my story, I, I totally relate with, you know, feeling guilty and not being able to, you know, participate if you're, you know, self quarantine for two weeks, but my story is a little bit different in that um, I felt guilty sometimes coming into work because sometimes I had this feeling of, I don't want to be here um, because it was really hard for my 
you know, for myself, from a mental health perspective, you know, you, you really have to, as a nurse, find strength in really difficult situations. And for me, um, my situation was a little unique because I was just coming back from maternity leave in March. And all I could think of in my head was this panic of I'm going to bring COVID home to my three month old son and to my husband. And then who's going to be able to take care of them if I can't. And, you know, so piggybacking off of guilt, but, but not because I wasn't thinking I won't be there for my coworkers, but also, but because of, I was kind of feeling like, why me? Why do I have to go in this situation? Um, being an ICU nurse, I knew I was going to be taking care of COVID patients all the time, 24 seven. And so I, I think I kind of psyched myself out before I even, you know, got to the COVID ICU units that, you know, I'm definitely going to get it, you know, every day is, is um, dangerous for me and woe is me type thing. And I think I, I realized probably a couple weeks in um, that, like Frankie said, um, your team, your nursing team is so important and you really have to use each other to, you know, find strength and be resilient. And I think one of the things that nurses don't realize is that they have this innate resiliency that we just, you know, it just kind of happens. We don't know. We deal with all sorts of change and we have to adapt every day. Um, and with the COVID situation, we adapted hour by hour. And I think you, you realize how much you re lean on your, um, your team members. And that's what I did. So I talked to a lot of people who were sharing the same sentiment that, you know, they were being anxious at work. What are they doing with their kids? And, you know, HUP created all of these amazing outlets for us. They, they got us um, social workers and um, licensed professionals for us to talk to. They got um, an anonymous discussion board up for us so we could um, have an outlet for our feelings and, you know, they could help us through the situation. And I think it was just really important um, for all of the nurses, ICU, COVID, you know, those not working with COVID to really be there for each other. So my experience was more, you know, drawing on um, the strength of your team and, and realizing the resiliency and the strength that you really can, you know, muster up in such a difficult situation. Okay, that that's powerful for so many different reasons. I think that one of the things that really stood out to me about your story, Claire, is that there are new ways that we're finding to be connected, to be there for one another. Um, and, you know, it's a very interesting contrast to the guilt that pops up when you can't be there for one another. So I really appreciate all of you taking the time to join us on this call to share your stories. Um, I often hear from some of my friends that or coworkers, um, I work in media, that we, some people don't know anyone who's contracted the virus. Um, so thank you. I'm, I'm so happy that you three have recovered and that you are sharing your story. It's important. I think that you're, you're sharing something that sometimes people have not yet had the opportunity to really um, engage with. So uh, we're about to transition into our next phase of the program, but I definitely wanted to just lob it back to you, you four, you five, <laughs> one last time and see if you had any uh, last thoughts based on anything that anyone else shared or anything that you want to leave all of us with. Yeah, I, I actually do have a last thought. I mean, this is an incredibly difficult time in this country. We're in the midst of a pandemic. There's inequity, there's racial disparities, there's racism, and it feels very unsettling, very isolating, very painful. But I, I was listening to these four nurses and I was thinking the future's bright. Um, when we have frontline workers, when we have heroes, healthcare heroes like this, um, I just felt very, um, very comforted. Um, hearing their stories, their stories were difficult, but uh, they had personally difficult stories and yet were committed to improving health and really um, to their communities. So uh, I wanted to end um, on a positive note because I'm so proud um, to work with these nurses and with all the nurses and healthcare workers that are part of my community. Thank you so much. 
for all the work that you do for your bravery. I mean, just because you work in the front line as a profession doesn't mean that you don't experience the human emotions that come with this challenging time. So I appreciate you facing your fears for the benefit of all of us. Um, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Marshall James Cavanaugh, who's also one of our featured storytellers, says thank you all for your stories. Stephanie echoes that. She says thank you for sharing. Terry, thank you for bringing us hope. And absolutely, I want to echo that too. Um, Terry and I met, had the privilege of meeting in the uh, working group that the Philly Counts 2020 Census had set up to really provide a very inclusive space for the community to help Philly pivot to help Philly counts in the 2020 census pivot. So um, it's been a joy working with you, Terry, over the last two months and engaging with you. And thank you so much for joy is mine. Really doing this. Thank you. All right. Um, we will pivot on to uh, our partners at Philly counts 2020 census. We're going to be hearing some uh, from some really amazing individuals. Ava and Jameer are about to come to the floor. So Chaz, if you can please unmute their microphones, that would be much appreciated. Um, they're gonna share their personal stories with us. Again, they do work with our um, partner organization on this program. Um, so they might share a couple of additional um, thoughts on what Stephanie Reed had shared with us at the opening of the program. But I definitely want to um, welcome Ava and Jameer to the floor to share your stories. So welcome. I think you, can you guys, are you guys unmuted yet? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Great. Um, so first, I just want to thank you, Quentin, so much for having us and for organizing this whole thing. Um, we kind of put this together really quickly um, and I'm super impressed with your work. Um, and thank you all for sharing your stories. I feel really privileged to be able to be a part of these conversations, um, especially during 2020. Um, as we all know, there's just so much going on in the world. And I think being able to have these conversations and relate to one another and hear each other's stories um, is really impactful, especially as um, someone that works in organizing. Um, I also, I wanted to give a shout out to um, the fact that it is about to be June, which is Pride Month. Um, and as you all know, COVID has kind of changed the way that people are celebrating Pride this year. Um, typically there are huge festivals, um, and parades during the summer. Um, the Philly Pride Parade um, is a huge place for community gathering and a lot of people look forward to it and make connections there. Um, so this year, um, a slightly less attractive um, proposal, but um, this is the year to queer the census. Um, I'm really encouraging folks to take this opportunity to stand up and be counted um, in 2020 um, as an expression of your pride and taking pride in your community and showing that you live in Philly and you count in Philly. Um, and especially in 2020, it's going to be really important for LGBTQ plus communities that we get the resources that we need to support those individuals, um, especially because members of the LGBTQ plus community um, disproportionately rely on services and programs like food stamps, Medicaid, um, support for homelessness, um, and so many other programs, and just our city services that we all use every day. Um, so on the census form, there is no option to uh, declare your sexual orientation. However, it's still really important that uh, members of the community uh, make sure that they get counted this year. Um, there is the opportunity for same-sex couples to indicate that they are their relationship um, in the same household. So that's also really important data um, that 
And that data will be um, critical to receiving the representation and the funding for those programs that I mentioned before. Um, so yeah, in, during June, the month of Pride Month, I just want to encourage everybody to use the hashtag Queer the Census, hashtag Philly, um, sorry, hashtag Philly Counts, um, and hashtag 2020 Census. Um, and encourage your friends and family members who may or may not be a part of that community um, to participate in the census as well. Um, and I want to hand the mic over to my colleague, Jameer. All right, thank you so much, Ava. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jameer Connolly, and I'm an organizing fellow with Philly Counts. And uh, in reference to the 2020 census, I feel like as the owner of a Black body, I've always been hyper aware of what it means to count and what it means to be represented now. And in this day and age, I also feel like I know what it means to be hyper visible. And I believe that in cities with like large numbers of historically undercounted individuals, it is imperative that we utilize initiatives like the 2020 census to help make sure that we get the resources that we need to help sustain ourselves. Yeah, and um, in reference to a story, I was, uh, one came to mind in reference when I was in um, college. So uh, I had went to a predominantly white institution and like most people, I had a few jobs on campus. So um, when I was working, I, uh, a lot of times I worked with, uh, a lot of times I worked with like uh, cleaning up more genitalia stuff like that. But uh, a lot of times there would be uh, families that would come in for tours. And they would sometimes talk to us and they would say, oh my God, like, yeah, you get to work at Lehigh. This is so cool. You get to do this, you get to do that. And one time, one of the families had stopped me and he said, wow, don't you wish that you got a chance to go to Lehigh University? That's my alma mater. And I was confused. I'm like, don't, I wish I had a chance to go here. But then I realized that uh, just by my visage, just by, my, just by uh, walking around, as the owner of a black body, people felt like I didn't belong. So saying all that to say, after that moment, I realized that it was imperative that I did make myself be seen. I tried to join as many clubs as I could. I tried to uh, even join student council because I wanted to make, I wanted to make sure that for the next generation of black students at Lehigh, that there was, a, that they knew that there was people on campus that looked like them and people on campus that were actively fighting for their fighting for their needs and making sure that their ideas and that their opinions were being heard. So yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to share. All I wanted to share. Thank you much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing, um, both Jameer and Ava. It's so important, representation is so important. And having that exposure to diverse stories is, really important to shaping the way that we view and understand the world that we live in. Um, so I appreciate and thank you for your, your bravery and sharing your story, Jameer. Um, I know you're getting some love in the chat. Feel free. Um, all of the attendees and storytellers who are not on the microphone at this time, feel free to just, you know, share some love and positive affirmation in the chat box. Our, our physical events in, at Current Broom Brew is usually very interactive. So that's something that we are missing a little bit of with the virtual space, but I see lots of people chiming in on the chat. Morris, um, Stephanie Sun, Terry, Marshall, thank you so much. Ava, thank you so much for offering that. Um, affirmation. So um, as a member of the tribe, I definitely encourage everyone to be counted in the 2020 census. I don't know if you can see, but I am wearing my Philly swag and I've got a little bit here in my, my little swag bin. And, you know, one of my favorite movies is actually Mean Girls, so I just have to preface that because I recognize that I am getting old and that movie's getting a little bit dated. But on Wednesdays, we wear pink, and on Fridays, we wear Philly Count Swag. So definitely be sure to check out their um, website. It's free swag. You know, it's really to encourage participation and make sure that everyone is 
submitting for the 2020 census, you can go to wethepeoplestage.com slash registration. We've got a little button that clicks right over to Billy Count's um, registration form, which only takes one minute to submit. Uh, their URL for that registration form is super long, which is why I just put that button on our website. But feel free to go get your free swag and t-shirt. Um, I don't really look good in a visor, Ava, so that's the reason why I'm not wearing mine, but you look great. So keep doing what you do. I am go, thank you. Gabby just put the link in the chat. So thank you so much for that. You can just go straight to the chat and get your Philly swag right there. Um, thank you again for sharing, Ava and Jameer. We are gonna turn the mic over to Mr. Mike Myers from Current Brew and Brew, who is currently working um, so I don't know if this is actually a good time for you, Mike, but if you are on the line, please speak up. Just let us know that you are here. Ah, he's here. Ah, oh, the man is here. Okay, all Mike. Right. You hear me, Ryan? Right? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, cool. You. Awesome. So, yeah, today we are talking about everyday grit. We're talking about faith. We're talking about why Philly counts. And of course, our frontline heroes. So. We know that you've stayed open, you've had to pivot your business, there's lots going on, and you've got probably your garage doors open right now, sweating a little bit and yeah, yeah. serving the community. So um, definitely wanted to just hear a little bit of what your story and journey has been, you know, in, in light of our current climate, current environment. So tell us a little bit about what you've been going through. Sure. Uh, first off, I want to thank you, Quentin. I mean, you, you do an incredible job. We've been working together, uh, doing some poetry things for the past, but I guess since wintertime, right? Actually, yeah. before that. Yeah. Um, always uh, a great person, a great person to talk to and to kind of uh, talk information about. Um, Quentin's always thinking of other people, and he's just a great person, and, and uh, I'm glad that we met and got to, got to meet. Um, Secondly, I definitely want to thank the frontline workers. I mean, I can't, I can't tell you how much respect and admiration I have for you guys and the amount of work you guys are doing. And you guys are just amazing people. And I just can't say uh, enough about it. Um, my part's, you know, a little less, you know, um, I'd say important, but it's, it, it's more, you know, trying to keep a small business going during, during times like these has been challenging. Uh, it's been different. Um, for those of you do, who don't know, my name is Mike. Uh, I own and operate uh, Current Broom Brew in Fishtown. Um, it's a small uh, cider pub uh, that I opened almost, almost two years ago. Um, and we have a small spot in an old carriage house up on Gerard Avenue. Um, that I actually rehabbed my, a lot of it myself. And, and um, it was just a, definitely a labor of love type project. Um, but now coming fast forward to where we are now, you know, things and pivoting and, and trying to change has been uh, very interesting. Um, I feel like, you know, the role um, is, 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 it's different every day. I think um, we've had to, to make some changes. I've, obviously working as much as I can to try to, you know, balance out what we need to survive as a company. Um, but on the other side of that, the people, I know Sean and Quentin are both on this call. I mean, they are like huge regular customers that, uh, you know, keep us going and keep me going and, and, and wanting me to keep, you know, at least doing my small part to, to help the community get, you know, their cider if they like their cider. So, you know, I can't say enough again about the the neighbors and Fishtown and uh, our regulars that were coming in here before this that still come in week after week. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to all the stories as I'm Phil Insider uh, in the background. Um, I've got two small canners um, that I have operating up on the bar, and that's pretty much how we're uh, doing business now. Uh, we're, we're getting online orders, which I've never done online before, um, and filling them on the spot, uh, which is something that's completely different and completely, you know, crazy. We, um, 
are typically open. This is a retail shop. So we're, you know, pouring drafts and, and having people come in and enjoying people, you know, enjoying themselves in the place. And now we've moved to, you know, to go online and canning on the spot. So um, it's been, it's been different. Um, but you definitely see, you know, some the positives in it as well. I mean, we're still here. Enough people are supporting us that we're still going. Um, and it's cool to, to get a little time safe, obviously, from the beginning, mask, gloves, all that good stuff. But it's good to hear, you know, from the neighborhood and, and see how everybody's doing. Um, and that's been really important, too. So um, that's kind of what keeps me going and keeps us going and uh, wanting us to, to get over the hump to the other side of this and, and hopefully safely get everybody back to, to work in order and, you know, um, as well as the other small businesses in town and all over the place. I mean, we just want to, to keep doing what we got into to business to do and that's support you all and, and, and in the small, you know, way that we can, I guess. Uh, so that's a little bit about what I'm doing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here and multitasking. Absolutely. You got to <laughs> do that. There's another piece that I forgot. Multitasking is everything. You got yeah. to be moving and shaking. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. So for everyone who um, does not already follow Current Brew & Brew, please go follow them on Instagram. They're linked to their online um, platform to purchase cider. He, he's got a customer. He's got to run. It's <laughs> online, online platform. So you can go do what this customer is doing, which is go to their beautiful garage in this refurbished carriage space and pick up some delicious cider. He's got some CBD product that I love. He's got his own custom wine. They do it all on mostly on site. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. I'm support current and it's current at current brew and brew on Instagram. Yeah. It's current brew and brew on Instagram. Please follow us. Please come in and check us out. If you haven't, we specialize a little bit real quick about the products. Like we specialize in dry ciders. We started making dry ciders about five, six years ago when, when that wasn't a really popular item. And um, we've, you know, come a long way and we have just, you know, a plethora of, of things that we, that we make now in house on site in Fishtown. Um, and we have a lot of fun with it, but, uh, we just started serving slushies yesterday as well. So now we have, uh, current cider slushies that people are lining up for. So, uh, please come check us out. Uh, thank you all again too, for, for your continued support and, and, uh, let's get to the other side of this for sure. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Again, I want to just relay um, a me couple messages from the chat. Marcus Henderson says, thank you. And we cannot forget about all of our frontline essential workers, the people who make sure our grocery stores, pharmacies, gas stations, corner stores, and so many others that I've missed are supported. I am extremely grateful to all essential workers. And then Stephanie Reed says, I love how adversity brings innovation. Thanks for sharing your story. So thank you. And um, I know you got a customer, so go ahead. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be listening. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Going All right. right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you in a bit. All um, right. But shout out to my team for helping us put together this story. And I really appreciate all those kind words, Mike. Um, it's definitely made possible by team effort and by our partners effort. Thank you to the mayor for tweeting about this event and sharing the uh, information with everyone. Um, and thank you to Sean, my neighbor. You know, I, I told him about this idea I had to help, you know, support Mike and our local businesses. And, you know, Sean just jumped right in. And, you know, he didn't ask too many questions. He's an event producer um, himself. Now he's in a different um, <laughs> incarnation uh, professionally, but he helped get the word around. So I want to, uh, to our neighbors in our, our neighborhood. So I appreciate you, Sean. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm gonna move on to our next storyteller who is Jamina. She is going to also be sharing a story on everyday grit and growth. So um, Jamina, are you on the line right now? Chaz, let's make sure that Jamina's line is unmuted if she's here. I don't see her name in the list just yet. She might be joining us in a little bit. Um, so in the meantime, 
we are going to introduce our next storytelling pair. I am going to um, just preface this by saying that, again, We the People stage is a space where we like to really hone, elevate, and share diverse stories uh, to create a more empathetic and connected tomorrow. I think we're definitely achieving that mission here uh, just by creating a little bit of connection during this time of, you know, increased isolation. I know some people are hitting the beaches and doing stuff, um, hopefully in groups of 25 or less, but we're here tonight and we're together. So I appreciate your presence. Um, typically our events happen in current in their attic space. You see that kind of like stairwell going up there. It's got amazing brick walls, love it. Um, we usually have featured storytellers. So we still have featured storytellers tonight, but they're usually solo acts tonight. We really wanted to encourage that sense of community and um, interaction that we naturally get in a physical space by giving people the opportunity to sort of dialogue and share stories in a group setting. Um, so that our next storytelling group is a duo and they're friend, uh, friends of mine, new friend, <laughs> um, Older friend, Marshall James Cavanaugh is a well-known poet here in Philly. He has a very interesting story, which he will be sharing with you. And Lindo, yes, is also a poet, phenomenal content. You should go check them both out on Instagram. Their um, Instagram handles are on their graphics. They can also drop it right in the chat feature, um, but stay up to date with what they're doing. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, you, Marshall, and Lindo, Chaz, can you please make sure that the lines are unmuted? Um, just speak up, Marshall and Lindo, if you are able to um, be heard. Here we go. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, um, how are you? I'm doing good. Marshall is just trying. There we go. Right. I think I'm on. Yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. Lindo, I don't know how you were wearing a sweatshirt, homie. Like, what are you doing right now? <laughs> are you? I'm always in the hood. <laughs> That's just my thing. I can't. You were making me sweat even more. Just watch. Okay. We yeah. won't talk about that. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing great. Definitely uh, um, feeling the summer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to hold on to my joy as much as I'm trying to hold on to my makeshift backdrop. <laughs> oh, I see it sliding. Yeah, it's just going to happen. I try my best, but my best sometimes doesn't impress most. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We're going to work with what we have because we're all trying to make it through this. So why don't you tell – oh, yeah, Mark says his AC is running. I really wish I had put my AC unit in before this. But <laughs> Marshall, Lindo, please take it away. Bless us and, um, you know, let us know what, what story is that you're going to be sharing with us tonight. Cool. Yeah, well, I am Marshall James Cavanaugh. I'm Dream Poet for Hire. Um, you might know me from Rittenhouse Square. I set up pretty often when we're not in quarantine uh, and type poems for people on demand. Um, I've also been, uh, you know, a traveling poet, traveled around the country, um, spent a lot of time uh, performing around Philly and around other venues in, in the area. Um, met Linda over, over time and uh, we've, we've shared the space. Uh, we've shared this, the, the non-digital stage uh, as Poets for Peace, um, which was a, a tour that went around the country with a bunch of different poets uh, in 2017 through 2019. Uh, and yeah, let Lindo introduce himself. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Lindo, yes, I'm spoken word artist. Um, very familiar to the uh, spoken word scene in Philadelphia and I have built a great friendship as well as just like, um, you know, partnership and uh, a very great p capacity with Marshall as far as just touring, doing shows together, pitching ideas and bouncing ideas. And one of the projects that we have been like working on in this, uh, you know, digital time is uh, Magic Manifestation, which I'm going to allow Marshall to explain a little bit more about. Yeah, so I mean, magic manifestations. Uh, a poet who types in a park uh, finds out he can't go to the park anymore safely. Um, but I feel like poetry is just as essential, you know. Um, so uh, worked out with a few collaborator friends from around the city as well as around the country 
uh, this idea of uh, doing these live streams um, where instead of just doing performance-based art, uh, we actually do uh, similar to what I do in the park, uh, live request line. Um, so almost like total request live for uh -huh. um, the poets and artists and creators out there. Um, and similar to how I perform poems, we've just been working on, um, you know, the, the simple, the simple like catch of uh, pick a topic and we'll create something. We'll manifest some magic, uh, manifest by request. Um, so yeah, with Lindo, um, we've been, you know, doing, we're both spoken word artists. We're both poets. Uh, we've been doing uh, poetry on demand um, with our community here in Philly mostly and really creating this space that, um, you know, it, go, it goes beyond like what we're saying or like what our words are, are uh, transmuting from the topics. It goes into creating this space that, uh, you know, for two months we haven't been able to gather in a, in a room together, um, but yet we can gather in rooms like this and uh, see each other's faces and uh, talk about the current events that are happening around us and um, really put them through like, I, I like to think like a poet, like think of a poet as uh, someone who um, takes like the, I guess like the collective thought and turns it into something beautiful or, or transmutes it into something that's useful. Um, I vibe with that. And I think you have a fan in the audience because I see Stephanie dropped into the comments. Marshall, I had you write a poem for my husband on his birthday. I was so, it was so beautiful and you made our day. So happy to see you here. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Isn't it such a beautiful little community, little yeah. small world? Um, I know you're famous and you got admirers and everything, but just, <laughs> it's nice to see that one of them is in this room. Uh, so, Lindo, tell us a little bit about your journey with magic manifestations. What's that been like? Um, it been a... a it been to me like the me and Marshall talk about it a lot. And, you know, at first I was hesitant about this space because this is new territory for me because Marshall been doing this a lot longer uh, as far as just like doing impromptu poetry and just uh, making his poetry accessible for communities in ways I haven't yet. I'm so used to just like, you know, perform my poems on the stage and networking afterwards or hanging out afterwards. But Marshall put himself in a space of just immersing himself in the community and allowing people to prompt them on the poetry that they want to hear versus coming with that poem already presented uh, for the community. Um, so when I was doing the sessions with him, it reminded me so much of being like in a writer's room with the innovation of just like the, the stories coming about because the community is prompting you. So imagine behind the scenes of just like how this script is being created and what is the thought process between the two people that are creating the script, but also being engaged with the people that are going to be familiar with the not familiar, but a part of the script or the actors of the scripts are also prompting you of what is needed in the script. So this becomes more of a community poem than anything else I have done because I'm asked, I need you to talk about this. I need, I really like this line. That didn't really hit for me. This is what really needs to be told about this story because this story is so much my, mine as much as it is yours. And when we invited that space, we also found ourselves talking about very vulnerable, heavy topics and sometimes just very lighthearted, lighthearted moments that embrace both the joy during these times as much it embraced the tragedy, tragedy of just like social dissident or just the collective grievances that we're having because we're all losing time, opportunity, people, and just the general idea of quality of life. But there's also joy in these moments of just innovation of just like, we're now being able to embrace an audience that was not accessible to us before because they don't have to be present in the room. So that allows us to be present with those that are differently able, those that have social anxiety and other uh, ailments that is just like a space can be not as accessible to them all the time. Mm. That's really powerful. And I appreciate the passion in which you're speaking about this because it's something that I'm very passionate about too. And I know that Elise is passionate about it. So Elise Chang is in the room and she says, Quentin Hart, Lindo Hart, Marshall Hart. 
Aww. dream team. Yeah, baby. So thank you, Elise, um, for dropping in the chat box. Terry says, art has never been more essential. Poetry, visual art, music, dance nourishes our souls. And yeah. I 100% agree. Um, this is this interest and this experience of what we're doing in general um, outside of even this virtual space, this happy hour and story share. It's a very collaborative space, you know, and that's one of the interesting things that actually brought Terry and Ava and Stephanie um, and I together and Gabby's on the line. And I know Kanye is here. There's so many people from the um, Philly Counts working group that's here. And it was so it was so awesome to see that there was this um, intention and, and mindfulness about creating an inclusive space for the community to to put their energy somewhere. I think a lot of us found ourselves wanting to do more um, when we had more time on our hands. You know, I think some people people respond in very different ways to what we're going through and the way that you and, and Lindo have decided to respond, the way that Philly Counts has decided to respond, you know, and this energy of collaboration is really beautiful. And I'm so grateful to have uh, met everyone at Philly Counts and at University of Penn. I'm definitely grateful to have met you both. I appreciate your early support of We The People stage when it's like, well, what is that? I mean, it's a cool name, but what is it, right? So. Mm -hmm. Thank you um, for also inviting me on to Magic Manifestations. Uh, talk, tell us a little bit more about this whole co-creation process. What has that been like? Um, and what, what does the name Magic Manifestations mean to you? Um, so I, I think like uh, the idea is, you know, we're all setting an intention when we gather together. Um, we, beyond us like writing poems for uh, people's requests, we also have a community topic um, and they're usually like simple, simple words, like let's all focus on this one intent um, with the idea that like, you know, collective thought and um, congregating together and creating together can be like a, a, a true medicine of spirit. Um, and just like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's this beautiful process of, of creating these spaces where, um, yeah, I don't know. The, the healing can happen. You know, it's it's uh, it's something that I think Lindo can talk about within, um, you know, poetry spaces in real life as far as uh, being a host uh, for uh, readings like uh, reading series like Pecola Breedlove. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I have worked over the last five years to create a, a safe space for black artists and you know with the focus on poetry and allowing all black identities to be welcome in the space and recognizing that you know within the uh, spoken word scene there's topics that um we need to be vulnerable about we need to come close about and we need to hold each other about and we need to hold space for it. and i've been doing that for the last five years and i, I recognize the healing properties of that space and recognize how like so much for so long um i've been i've been finding safety in poetry because i was able to express my ideas in a ways of just like not it being interrupted by what i would say like uh white ideas or white microaggressions or anything else and just allow it to be without having to focus on other voices interrupting it and finding joy in that existence in a sense what I, I like to describe as a black joy in the sense of just like thinking about myself um, celebrating without any uh, idea of oppression or, you know, taken away from it. So it is the joy of just like walking into the store, not being followed and those other things, not always looked upon as a, a hinder to the environment or just being simply valued or not feeling the need to just like hide my anger or upsetness sometimes. And that's what that space provided for um, so many black poets and, you know, collectively black artists all together. And um, Marshall had asked me uh, to share a story that focused both on just like how my art is a safe space, but also 
uh, sometimes when individuals are engaging in my art, it, it becomes an unsafe space in a certain sense. Um, because sometimes people identity of freedom is an identity that's built on oppression and sounds in those voices, um, even though this space is for all of us and we all own this space. So I'm going to uh, share a story that is then going to go into a poem that may sound like a story, but you're going to recognize both transitions. Um, so I have done a lot of like uh, activism work and some of the activism work is uh, running fundraisers to uh, refuse fascism and recognize it in every parts of our American life. And these are monthly like showcases where it's just three artists that present things that are on the topic with their art or not on the topic to allow us to just be in a space and mind that we're together in this idea of just refusing fascism and what does that mean. In the midst of like me hosting a show, I introduce, uh, uh, I introduce an artist whose identity is white as well as someone that is a woman, identifies as a woman, and they played the ukulele, they sung three songs, and then they ended their set with no, no disruptances or uh, anything that hindered their voice in that very moment. Um, then I uh, did a poem. In the area that we were in, we're in South Philly near a park, and the park often has football practices that are going on, uh, you know, at the same time, we're doing this event and we're just holding space for both things. We're in the backyard of this establishment there in the park, which is, you know, right across the street. Um, so this will give you an idea of the vibe and the environment that we're in. And in the midst of me just sharing poems and stuff like that, there's a few neighbors that come out. Um, one was an older white couple and two were just like, just older white individuals. And as a midst of me sharing my poem, I'm recognizing from, from the back of the audience uh, gesturing to me to quiet down. Um, just to give you an idea of the volume of my voice, um, I'm, not, I'm not performing with a mic. Um, I'm also recognizing that the other spaces that I'm sharing it with, as far as it being a neighborhood, as far as it being 5 p.m. on a day, and all those things I'm being considerate of, um, they gestured me to, uh, to quiet down and then they talked over me and said that, yo, we're all for whatever y'all for, um, but you're also infringing on our rights to just be home right now. And it, it was one of those moments where I find myself being triggered because I'm so upset because the performer before me had an amp and was using a mic. An amp needed for their guitar and a microphone because they have a more soft spoken voice than myself. And it was not the same type of uh, attention given to them. It was not the same type of uh, aggression towards their voice. And it made me think about my identity and made me think of just like, what do I do in this moment so I can make sure I'm considering a community that's outside of me because like my feelings hurt, but right now I have to host an event. I have to, you know, fundraise money to refuse racism, to combat these type of issues and microaggressions in the world. So I'm thinking to myself, I often kill people with kindness. So in those very, mo in that very moment, I'm like, oh, thank you so much for holding me accountable. I really appreciate you know, you give me notice of this, I'm gonna be mo more moving through my set with more consideration and quiet down for the folks that are living in the neighborhood. As I continue in a more soft-spoken voice, I am then, then gestured down to even quiet down more to the point where I just, I'm just out of the poem now. The poem was my safe space and I was hoping to, you know, go back into the poem feeling just as safe and holding myself accountable moving forward. But then I just felt unsafe because it was just a moment where I was just like, yo, there's so much pressure as far as like responsibility that I hold of this event hosting it. But then there's also a responsibility of myself of just making sure I get home tonight. And what does that look like? Because if they do call the cops, I don't want that interaction. I don't know what, I don't know how to unclutch my fist in that moment. I don't want, know what that means. So I just, in my set, 
and I apologize to them. And then I gather myself together to introduce the next artist. Um, the poems that they had grievances with, that they felt as though were too loud, are the poems I'm sharing now. I remember my favorite parts of my day is when I get to experience joy with my nephew. When we get to, get to throw back the football until the rain comes. And when the rain comes, we go inside, we watch cartoons. In the midst of us changing the channel, we see Donald Trump sit next to Obama. And every time I hear and see Donald Trump, I hear and see a bounty hunter, a bounty hunter black in plantation times that used to catch a runaway slave, bring him back to the Austin block of plantation or get a free man, rip up his freedom papers, bring him back to the auction block of plantation. Every time I think of the plantation, I think of the crime bill and how many people are put in the prison system as if it was a plantation. Every time I saw Obama, I saw a free man holding back tears. I looked my nephew in the eye and said to myself, it's a new day, it's a new day. Obama looked like a free man giving his house to the bounty hunter after endorsing a former slave owner that put us on plantations. He's trying to convince us that this is as American as apple pie as if we didn't get a slice of it at the dinner table with Jim Crow, Uncle Sam, Uncle Tom, giving us the Trayvon verdict. We are hurt, we are scarred, and America wants us to cover up our scars with our emotional makeup. You know, grin and bear, maybe put up a fist in silence. Well. There have been too many riots of the unheard. We finna turn up the volume of the speaker, make a lot of noise, break a lot of glass ceilings, stump on the floor, leave the ground breaking, cause we've been carrying America on our ache and lich back for too long. And tell me, what's more patriotic than that? To love a country that keeps on reminding you that it hates you. I mean, the electoral collars look like the, KK, the red carpet for the KKK. And we finna cut a rug, do a one-two step that leave footprints of a giant because they trying to abort for a nation. We're going to abort that ignorance. Plan Parenthood is to raise sons and daughters to a new day to come. And I know they're going to come for me, asking me to say sorry when I've been too unapologetic lately because I have too much faith in my culture, too much faith in my people, and too much faith in a new day to come. And I tell you all something. I have been working too hard on my name to see it be a hashtag in the morning. I'm grateful every morning I don't wake up a hashtag. A trend atop of the tragedy. A black and brown body outlined in white, red blood, water, and concrete because of red blood, red water, and concrete because of shades of blue. White lies are finding how black lives matter. My God, let's raise sons like morning. Too many sons we mourn, too many raises in the sun. And there have been a war on colors. Ever since we've been coloring and coloring books, they've been booking colors and books of ambition where you should be worried. Because even those that survive lose years of their life in bays and gray boxes with no windows, when they come out, you can barely see their soles of their windows. They look lost. And I have lost myself in tears, found myself here crying because I haven't yet grieved over Trayvon. He looks so much like me when I saw him. I thought I died, became a hashtag in the morning, a trend on top of the tragedy, a black and brown body outlined in white, red blood, water and concrete because of shades of blue, white lies are finding how black lives matter, my God. Let's raise sons like morning. Too many sons we morning, too many raises in the sun, too many raises in the sun, my God. Please don't let me be a hashtag in the morning. Thank y'all. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure that if we were in the physical space and everyone was unmuted that you would be getting a lot of um, feedback right now. I see a lot of people jumping in the chat. So if you have any feedback for our story sharers, please continue to engage in the chat. I see that Jennifer, Elise says, I'm so sorry that this happened to you, Lindo. Jennifer says, Lindo, thank you for sharing about your safe place and share to share your vulnerability and creative mind. I'm honored to have heard your story today. Imagine a world where your safe place is reality, open space, and for all to and 
for all to see your creativity, love, and beauty. This is so powerful. Um, there's a lot of comments in response to what you both just shared and what you shared, Lindo. So I will leave you to uh, read some more of those amazing comments that everyone is um, so graciously and generously sharing with the group. So thank you for sharing that to both of you. Thank you for your contribution to the world uh, creatively and with your beautiful energy. We um, are clearly going to, through very challenging times times right now very very challenging times that i can't um really speak about right now because i don't want to uh go into a tangent but i do appreciate you bringing that element to our program tonight so thank you thank both you for inviting yeah. me thank you quentin for having us yeah, yeah thank you everyone for sharing your stories tonight <laughs> yes yes thank you to everyone um please remember to um Follow those people that you're connecting with tonight. So you can follow um, at Lindo, yes, and at Dream Poet for Hire to keep up with their happenings, with magic manifestations, and all of the wonderful creative work that they are bringing into the world. We have another creative spirit in the room. I know that um, had a little bit trouble finding Jamina prior to us jumping into um, and hearing 